A oh, very good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this wonderful session on "From Burnout to Bliss: Practical Tips for Managing Workplace Stress." Stress is a troublesome phenomenon that strangles us, making us unable to function actively. As humans, we all have stress in our lives. What distinguishes a happy person from an unhappy is one who he handles stress in his life. Let us understand some practical tips for managing workplace stress from our trainer today, who is Mr. Yakin Sikandar. He is a psychotherapist, counseling psychologist, international author, youth activist, life coach, public speaker, business consultant, and an entrepreneur. He is the co-founder and CEO at Alexander and Paul LLP, a consultancy that provides programs and career development, soft skills, and employability. He born and raised in Kashmir, India. He published his first book, The True Purpose of Life, at the age of 17, making him one of the world's youngest published authors. A warm welcome to you, Yakin, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon from Turkey. And over to you. The floor is yours now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Venkat, for um, introducing me, and thank you, Shiva, and both to you, uh, everybody at Ethica, for um, inviting me for this program. I hope everybody can hear me and um, see me, and uh, gives me absolute uh, delight uh, to be here with you in this program from burnout to bliss. Practical tips for managing uh, workplace stress. Uh, so, in today's program, uh, we're gonna discuss. how uh, we reach from uh, literally uh, burnout to bliss and we're going to talk about uh, stress and what it means and how we can manage it um so the presentation is going to be there for like an hour and then we have like half an hour of uh, question and answer sessions uh, which i believe is really essential now some of the reminders i won't be able to see all of you but then we will have a like a panel when you ask your questions at that time you can come up and i would recommend you highly to turn on your camera so that i can see you and it feels like you know we're having more of a human interaction uh, one of the highly recommended things in this uh, brief workshop for the evening would be please have a pen and paper next to you we might be doing some activities i mean i know we are all very tech savvy but you know like an old notebook i have here it never gets out of fashion you know like uh, for different tasks so please have a notebook and pen next to you uh, that would be very helpful and also later on if we have any questions and uh, anything that you want to follow up with from the program at yakin skander that's my universal handle uh, on every single website so that's something that we can uh, catch up later on with now about me uh, venkat has already introduced me but just to tell you briefly uh, i'm a research scholar i'm a psychotherapist a clinical psychologist i live in istanbul turkey with my wife i was born and raised in india in kashmir to be specific i'm doing my doctoral degree here which also includes sometimes teaching students but another manifestation of my life is what i'm doing right now here with you that i work as a wellness and uh, wellness consultant and performance coach for different companies and universities um and uh, it, when i'm free i love um, you know going to nature camping backpacking and i'm a big fan of uh, traveling and telling and encouraging people that you know what have a getaway and travel now uh, in today's workshop what is the agenda for today that we have uh, we'll talk about we'll start with the basic questions like what stress actually means and why do we need to manage it and how do we manage it so we have a four point formula for managing stress that we discuss and uh, if we don't manage stress what happens then then we'll go on talking about what really burnout means because these terms have become very common we commonly use oh i feel very stressed uh, i am having a burnout so it's very different when we use these terms in a clinical sense as clinicians so we'll introduce you to that as well and then some practical techniques what are some of the activities that can instantly or over a sustained period of time uh, relieve us of stress and how do we manage the whole part of the stress and ultimately um we'll talk about some uh, skills to develop we'll talk about some of the activities some of the micro routines that we need to uh, put in place in our lives so that 
what we call as corporate burnout so that we can more turn it into bliss, not just for the professional life, but also in our personal life. So having that transformation as well, I thought that would be something value added, uh, not just talking about stress management, but how do we move towards this wellness or the idea of wellness over a long period of time for a, for long term? That was my idea. Now, um, starting off with an activity, like I said, uh, paper and pen next to you. So I'm going to show you what we call as a stress thermometer. So the stress thermometer is two is like you're really happy and cheerful. And four is like you're happy. Six is like you're somewhere in between, right? And eight is like you're down. You are stressed, very stressed. And 10 is you're burning out literally. So how do you rate yourself? And by the way, it doesn't have to be two, four, six. It can anywhere be between one to 10, but two is optimal. Uh, why? Because we can never be without stress and we'll discuss that. So it can be three, it can be three and a half. So how do you rate yourself? So I want all of you, and we're going to discuss about this. Uh, I want all of you to rate yourself on this scale of uh, one to 10 and you see what the numbers represent, how do you rate yourself in this stress right now that you have, especially believing that all of you are coming from an industry, from a, a corporate setting and world, how do you feel in terms of your stress levels? So please write that number down. And I hope you just wrote it down based on a little bit of, you know, uh, assessing your uh, subjective well-being and writing down how you feel. Okay, so keep it, uh, you know, there safe with you and we'll discuss that later on. And why is this uh, essential? I think it's uh, really what we are talking about, stress management. It's essential, especially because uh, in the current month, you know, it's financial closing uh, globally. And because of uh, the financial year closing, things start getting even more uh, stressful. There are things at the end of the year, tasks that you have to do. An interesting thing about stress and why is it important to talk about right now is that stress is cumulative. It adds up. For, for instance, sleep is not cumulative. If you, don't, if you sleep less hours one night, another night, like if it's eight hours, you only slept four hours, another night you wouldn't need 12 hours sleep. If you just sleep eight hours, it's fine because sleep doesn't add up. I mean, if that was the case, we'd sleep for days, but stress does add up. So small parts of stress that keep adding up, it's cumulative, unless we find ways to uh, get rid of it. So that's why um, our idea of life is not only to survive, but it's also to thrive, to grow in difficult times, which are especially the month of March. So I can understand, and the business part of me understands that, you know, you have to close your books, you have to get in touch with all the different departments, accountants, so it can be very stressful. And that's why we are doing this. And thanks to Ethica for bringing this uh, program right at the moment when we need it most. So starting from the basic question, you all would have an idea of what really um, stress is, because we use this term a lot, uh, I feel stressed, or um, I feel I'm burning out. But the question is, when we talk about stress, I thought like, why don't we have a comprehensive view? Because understanding something is really essential to know if you're actually feeling it or not. And me being a uh, you know, apart from being a coach, being a clinician as well, being a clinical psychologist. So I think uh, that perspective is really essential. When do we say something is really significant in terms of um, its nature? So is what is stress and is it always bad? Now, just to give you an overview, there was this report, you know, which was uh, done by McKinsey in 2022, which showed that most of the Indian people actually show signs of burnout, distress, anxiety, and depression. And we'll talk more about that. This was from their employee mental health um, and burnout, a time to act. So stress, simply put, what is stress? Stress is when you feel your environment, your workplace, your job, your life is demanding from you things that you don't have enough resources to deal with. So if your body and your self is um, capable of coping up with some stressors or daily life incidents. When you feel 
huh, this is more than that. And now I am feeling stressed because you feel you don't have enough time. You feel you don't have enough resources. You don't have enough energy or you are not well enough compensated for what you are supposed to do or uh, at, at your workplace, for instance. And that's what leads to stress. So it's an activation process when you feel that resources are not enough to mobilize in order for me to do my job properly. And we feel stressed. And in India, it's especially very common. Why? Because uh, lately it is happening, but I can see the transition why we don't prioritize our mental health. I mean, in Bollywood and movies and dances, people always ask me, like Indian people are very happy. But if you see in the happiness index of uh, 2023, uh, India is on 126th number when it comes to happiness. So we are not even top 10, top 20, top 50, top 100 in terms of countries of happiness, even though our movies, our dances, our series that people see all over the world, what is India famous for is Bollywood. And they think really people are that much happy. But reality of the matter is, especially in the corporate world, the report said that every uh, four in 10 respondents uh, have these symptoms. So I think we need to take the problem of stress very seriously. Now, the idea is it's much more common than we think. There was another survey done by Business Insider and Business Insider found that the Indian employees that they surveyed, the idea was 38% of the people showed signs of burnout. And that's that's a huge number. 41% showed signs of uh, depression and anxiety was 40% among 40% in the people. And anxiety and stress are very closely related and anxiety and burnout are very closely related. So ultimately we're talking about a huge number of people who are going through stress. Now, that's why I have this infographic. This is really essential uh, to understand. Brings us back to the question, is stress always bad? No, it's not. Stress is actually a life force which motivates us. I mean, remember when we were students, unless you see the date sheet, you know, we never perform or we never study or unless uh, if we have a directive or a job uh, description or a profile that we have to do this and we have a deadline, we start getting activated. And that stress, we call it you stress, which is exactly this optimum stress, which is the third part of it, which is the optimum stress here. But then when stress increases, like your pressure from the life increases more than you can cope up with, that's called distress. So stress has two types. One is you stress, and you stress is a good stress, which we need in life, which keeps us motivated. But the problem stress with the stress that we have is distress. And distress is really bad. So you see, there are people who are very inactive. And you can see what happens in different conditions with mood, sleep, control, awareness, and decision. In other words, your stress levels affect these major five parts. Stress affects your mood. It affects the way you sleep. It affects the control that you think you have over life the awareness of your surroundings and awareness of what is happening in your life and ultimately decision-making power. So when we have too much stress, which is the overload, what ends up happening is we start feeling very irritated or uh, sleep becomes a problem. You're not able to sleep properly or take proper rest or you feel you're not in charge of your life. Same with anxiety because stress and anxiety are closely related to each other. And you're not interested in things anymore. Things that used to give you pleasure. Oh, I used to love sports. Hi, it was really good to watch a series or movie. But this thing which is stressing you, maybe your work, maybe anything else, it's ruminating. It's continuously in your mind. It's just churning around and it gets harder to make uh, decisions. So that's why uh, it needs to be understood that stress is not just one thing. Stress is actually a scale. More than saying yes or no, uh, stress is a spectrum. So we have to think in terms of spectrum. So too little stress means you're too inactive or you're way laid back. You know, you have, you're underloaded in terms of life. Optimal stress means that you have enough of it to perform. But when it increases, too much stress or overload of work or the things that you're able to manage, things which are on your plate at that moment, over the time when it adds up, it leads to burnout that we are going to talk about. 
And the worst part of the burnout is what we call as a breakdown. But I hope nobody has reached that level yet or wouldn't reach that level because burnout needs hospitalization. It's literally when body shuts down 100%. And that is when burnout is not treated. Long-term long term stress leads to burnout and long-term burnout leads to what we call as breakdown or nervous breakdown. So it is dangerous and it gets accumulated. And we're going to talk more about that and together, then we'll do some activities that will help us to um, overcome and manage our stress. So remember, uh, stress is not something that you want to get rid of. I don't want to be stressed. Yes, you do want to be stressed. But to the level where it's optimum, where it's helping you, where it's functional stress, and you don't want to reach a level where it's uh, burnout or where you're, you, you feel you're not capable. So we don't wanna get rid of stress, we wanna manage stress. And that's really essential uh, to distinguish. Now, in terms of some of the symptoms and risks, and I want you to, that's why you have a notebook uh, you know, uh, next to you, and you have already rated yourself in terms of stress thermometer, right? Where your stress is. Now, we will talk about some of the symptoms and then risks. Uh, talking about the symptoms, you can also note down while I'm talking about the symptoms, if you feel any of those symptoms within yourself. And if you think that is mostly coming out of problems in life or mostly out of the workplace issues. Now, in terms of um, uh, stress, a lot of people exhibit different kinds of symptoms like physically, cognitive symptoms. And uh, we have issues related to mental health, but generally what do people feel when they say uh, we are stressed or what does stress do to you? Headaches. These are called psychosomatic symptoms. You have unexplained headaches, right? You might be taking aspirin or you might be taking uh, paracetamol. It does subside, but then it's unexplained. Like why so many headaches? Then you start saying that maybe it's because I am in front of a computer too much, or maybe it's because of some other reasons, but it's also because of stress. Stress can cause unusual or headaches when you don't expect them. Uh, feeling sweaty in your body, shivering and uh, acidity. One of the common problems which comes with too much stress is um, heartburn, nausea, you feel restless, like you are sitting uh, in your office, in your cubicle or wherever you work, but you do feel, you, you, you feel more fidgety or you get angry faster than usual. You don't wanna get out of your bed or you eat too much or you eat too little. Your food and sleep patterns are affected. That is a, a, a these are from the core symptoms of stress. So write down which you feel in yourself or you don't wanna meet friends. You don't wanna socialize. You always feel tired. You wake up in the morning, you're tired. You go to bed, you're tired. You wake up the next day, you're still tired. And you start thinking, maybe this is about age. Even though you might be 25, you might be 30. And you'll be like, ah, oh, my back, it's really like hurting like an old man. Or I feel so tired when I shouldn't be. Because we don't think that over a period of time, uh, the stress might have accumulated. And that's why I'm feeling continuously tired. Like I said, feeling angry or um, weight gain or weight loss. And we'll be talking about that as well, why uh, you know we gain weight because a lot of our work involves sitting down at uh, one place. And remember, just on a side note, I'll tell you, uh, you know, before I forget, if you're a person who works in an office and most of your work is related to sitting down, you're not in a position where you have to move around a lot, make sure you do that. Why? Because uh, second most common reason of heart attacks and cardiovascular disease is actually lack of movement. It's not unhealthy food. It's not smoking. It is lack of movement. So always get in the movement is very essential. Okay. And always feeling that, you know what, you have too less time and you have too many things to do and you are negative about things. Yeah. So among these symptoms, if you have written down the ones that you feel, are there. Uh, some of them you read, some of them I said what I see in our uh, clients or patients. And then what ends up happening is uh, when we tell people that stress takes years of your life, how? It takes years of your life and money because cumulative stress, when it's added, let's say burnout, there is a positive correlation, which in research means that the more a person is stressed, the more likelihood of having cardiovascular disease, uh, strokes, 
high blood pressure and a weak immune system, which means you're susceptible to a lot of other infections. It could be common flu, it could be cold, or it could be any other things. So all these things can happen actually because of stress. So a lot of stress, we're talking here about negative stress or distress when I say stress in general. So stress, over a long period of time increases your risk of cardiovascular disease as well as other uh, physical ailments that um, need to be um, taken care of. So that's why when we are stressed and worried at the same time, stress is more what we feel in our body. I talked about the symptoms like being fidgety, being irritable. These are physical symptoms, right? So Stress we feel more about in our body. And a lot of people ask then, what is the difference between stress and worry? Worry is more cognitive. When you're worried about something, it's more mental than physical. But stress is literally physical in the body. Your body feels it. And when you combine the two, stress and worry, that's what you call as anxiety. Because I said, it's close when we talk about what stress and anxiety is. The difference is anxiety is more cognitive but it affects you physically as well. While stress by itself is very physical, put stress and worry together and that's a dangerous equation. And that's where you end up anxious. And then there are a lot of anxiety disorders that we treat for instance. So remember stress is physical and worry is more in terms of your uh, thoughts. Yeah, very important to understand that. Now, when we talk about managing stress, coming to the core issue, two big questions arise before we go to the activities part. How should we manage our stress or why should, and why should we manage our stress? Why does it, yeah, we talked about the health reasons, but what else? How can it help managing stress? How can it help us in our life? And before we go there, let's do another activity. Okay, so you have the piece of pen and paper. I have a piece of pen and paper with me as well. So let's do an activity in which we are going to write things that are making us stressed. You know, so I, I'm, I'm going to do the activity with you as well, because I haven't done it um, from a couple of weeks, I guess. So we can write about stressors. Look, look, there are positive stressors. So, for example, things that motivate you. Here we're talking about distress, things that might be stressing you. It might be your work. What about work? because it's a closing month, right? Financial month. So that might be affecting you. For me, what is affecting me right now, uh, mostly is because uh, too many projects. It can be, by the way, about work. It can be about family. It can be about friends. It can be about your health, right? So write down, we have a couple of minutes at least, or even more, just write down. I want you to uh, write and feel like, you know, what's happening to, when it comes to stress. There are two minutes there. The timer is on. We have a couple of minutes. And in these couple of minutes, write about things that are making you stressful. Uh, finances can make you stressful, uh, uh, by the way, as well. It's not just work. It's your health, finances, family, work, a lot of things. Write down what do you think. And you can be very specific as well. You know, I'm stressed because of my friend. I'm stressed because of my partner, because of my parents, things as such, because of my work, because of my boss, because of my coworkers. Could be a lot of things because we now talked about the symptoms and what really stress is. So you have clarity of what stressful things you're going through. 30 seconds, friends. And then we'll be back about discussing stress but we want to make a complete list of things. That are relevant. All right, so let me close the timer. And I really hope that all of you have uh, at least noted down on the top of your head, significant um, stressors that may be affecting your life in a negative manner, and you might be feeling some of the symptoms that we talked about, right? Now, 
when we talk about stress management, let me tell you a practical reason why we should manage stress. And this is really essential lesson about humans and um, human evolution. So always start with why. It's very essential when we are as humans, we have to ask this question of why. Why manage stress? And I'll give you a very good physiological reason that might be helpful for you or you might have felt curious about it. And it's about our human body. And one of the things that we should respect and know about is our human body. Now, we have a response in our human body, which is really essential to understand when it comes to stress and anxiety. It's called fight or flight response. Now, what happened is over thousands of years of evolution, human beings developed this safety mechanism. It is when you see a danger in the environment, I see a snake, I see a lion. What am I going to do? Either I'm going to fight with it. If I see a lion, I will be like, I can't fight it. It's too strong. So flight, I'll run away. Okay. So it's a mechanism that human beings have. It's the same thing which happens when we are stressed. Fight or flight response. That something is stressing us. Why? Because we are scared of something. We're scared of our uh, KPIs. We're scared of the new bu budget which the company has or the new tasks that we have been given. So what ha ends up happening in our body is this, when we are in a panic mode. Body releases hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Increased cortisol means more stress. And one of the ways that one of the scientific ways of knowing if a person is very stressed is you check cortisol levels in blood. It's a hormone. But what happens when cortisol and adrenaline, you know, those people, adrenaline junkies, they want to have adrenaline, they want to have this rush. So what ends up happening in this mode, what we call as fight or flight is body releases these chemicals because we're feeling scared of something and our heart starts beating fast. And hearts, when heart starts beating fast, we get into this mode of panic. And when we say, ah, I'm feeling very anxious or really stressed because this thing came up. And what is the reason for that? The reason is in the ancient times when, you, when we were scared of something, I gave the example of lion, right? So when I see a lion, I'm really scared, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to run. But what do I need to run? I need strong legs to run, right? I need strong muscles to run. So what ends up happening when we are scared in a panic or stress mode, the body sends blood, more blood to the legs. So what does it mean? Body has limited amount of blood, right? So it means when more blood is in legs, there is lesser blood in the brain. Blood only has the brain only has the blood just to function and breathe and do basic things, which is why when I am stressed or when you are stressed or in panic, we are not able to think clearly. There is not a single person who can think clearly when they're panicked or when they're stressed. So think about, you know, doing a mistake in your office work, getting the numbers wrong, or uh, you were asked to do something, you did something else. More often than not, you made the mistake because you were stressed. Yes, there are honest mistakes. You overlook something, that's fine. But whenever we are in stress, we are never able to perform properly. Reason? Our mind is working on an instinctual or basic mode. So in order to work properly, we need a lot of brain. We need a lot of blood flow to the brain. So in order to do that, we have to get out of the panic mode. And how do we do that? We're going to discuss that part as well. But remember, this is why it's essential to manage stress to make proper decisions. Another big reason which me as a performance coach, what I teach people and companies is what we call as peak performance. So it's a state of mind in which you are performing to the best of your ability. You feel confident. You feel things are, you know, you're, you don't have to put so much effort in things because you love doing them and you're feeling very concentrated. And the biggest enemy that we have of peak performance in companies or in corporate settings or educational academic settings is actually stress. So one of the things which stops people from performing at their peak is the workload stress and the workplace stress that they have. And the idea is if you have to reach peak performance, what do you do? You don't have to come and ask, how do I reach peak performance? You have to ask the question, what is preventing me from peak performance? You know, like Rumi said, your task is not to seek love. Ah, I want to fall in love. It's asking ourselves, what is stopping me from going there? 
So ask yourself, what is the barrier to my peak performance? Ah, I should be in this year. I see myself in the coming years in being the top, uh, you know, C-level manager or wherever your goals are. But rather than asking yourself, how do I reach there? What is preventing you from being there? And in a lot of the times, it's actually the stress, which has many different sources that actually prevents us from being there. So practically speaking, there are four A's. You know, you can write it down in your notes, the A's. Like, you know, there are four A's which we use to manage stress, okay? And then we'll go to the activity which will give us more uh, clarity about it. So the first A that we have to use is actually avoidance. We do think like, you know, uh, avoidance might not be a good idea. Trust me, sometimes it's the best idea that you can do. What does that mean? If there are people who make you feel stressed, avoid them. You literally avoid people who make you feel stressed. And there is a skill that we teach people, especially as uh, clinicians, it's called assertiveness. A lot of us find it difficult to say no to people. Maybe you can take a note on your notebook. Are you one of those people? You know, people tell you something. It can be friends, family, boss, or anybody. And you find it really difficult to say no. You know, uh, you have your plate is full. Uh, but still, your uh, manager asks you, you have to do one more task. So you're not able to say no. Okay. So instead of saying no, you're like, huh, I'll do it. But instead of doing it properly, you end up seeing that you have too much on your plate and now you're not able to do any of those tasks. So if you're one of those people, remember, uh, we all sometimes find it difficult to say no, but you can avoid situations and people who don't make you feel comfortable right? And if you feel you have too much on your plate, um, you can actually say that, you know what, maybe I have too much on my plate. And you'll tell me, how do I do that? How do I do this to my manager? I'll give an example of this. If you work like all of you are professionals, you work in a corporate setting. So you are doing already a lot of different tasks that you have. One, two, three, four, five. You have a presentation, you have an Excel sheet, you have this and that and other. And your manager comes or your boss comes and he's like, uh, please do this thing and I need this uh, ready by afternoon and it's morning. What do you do? You don't know how to say no. Now you feel like you're stuck. Um, rather than just accepting it, then thinking, I'll see later on what the consequences are. What you can actually do and say, ah, thank you so much for thinking that I'm up to this task. Um, today, my task is like, I'm doing this, 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 and this, and this. So can you please help me in prioritizing which of the tasks should I do first and uh, then adjust your presentation? How would I put it in my schedule? Can you please help me with that? I really like this idea. And what, ha what ends up happening most of the time is your boss will be like, huh, you actually have a lot already on your plate. Let me find X, Y, Z to do this task instead. So what you did actually is you did not offend your manager rather than you acted in an assertive manner that protected your rights and let your boss know that, you know what, uh, he has or she has many other things to do. Let's find somebody else. But what ends up sometimes happening when we don't have this avoidance skill, we end up accepting a lot socially, family-wise, a lot of responsibilities. And even from our culture, we have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of baggage, which people that I see in individualized cultures like Europe, et cetera, which they don't have. So that can also lead you to stress. So first thing, avoidance and learning the art of saying no. I mean, we even did a program. I did a workshop. The whole of the program was about the art of saying no and how do we develop that skill. So avoidance can help you really in managing the stress. After that, alter. Alter means to change, right? And what can you change? If there is something which is stressing you or if there is someone that is stressing you, that someone can be your coworker. It could be ne person next to your cubicle. It could be in front of you. It could be somebody in the HR or finance department. Doesn't matter. You need to talk about it. So if somebody is bothering you about anything, uh, it could be your housemate. It could, those of you who are single, who are living on your own, it could be any person. If you're not comfortable with something, you in order to change it, you would actually have to mention it. What ends up happening is when we don't call on other people about their behavior and you keep, um, you keep bearing it, you know? So what ends up happening is you start feeling more and more stressed. So your feelings of negativity towards people or things, they build over the time and they increase stress. But if you just nip it in the bud, you don't like somebody's habit of, um, you know, 
sh- taking things from you, for example, without your permission, that can be something small, taking something from your table or taking your eatables, which were in the fridge, which is a communal thing or which has your name label uh, stuck on it. It could be many different things. Uh, if you're not happy with it, the best thing is to communicate it. You know what? Um, I am really not comfortable in doing this. So what it ends up, it doesn't build the stress. But if you keep accepting and accepting your anger, your rage, your irritability, it keeps increasing. So it's like you're giving somebody a room in your head without any rent, you know, rent-free space that somebody is living there because you're constantly thinking about it. Another big reason to, of uh, stress. And I think in our cultures, because uh, I come from India as well, the idea is that uh, we, we, we suffer emotionally a lot. And this is one of the ways that we suffer. Why? Because sometimes we find it difficult to communicate our feelings. And what else you can do is if something is bothering you and you have a good friend, you have a good partner, you can talk about them. Like, you know, something is bothering me because at least it builds your support network. So the idea is the environment around you, you can actually change and modify it. And in order to do that, you can use the alter way, alter technique. Now, the third thing to manage your stress is actually adapting. So what if you cannot avoid something? And you'll be like, I can't avoid this person. This person is my manager. I have to face them. And even the look of this person is uh, making me uh, stressful. What do I do? Or if I cannot do anything about it, I can't change. Okay, we can adapt. How do we adapt to things? We have something we call as cognitive dissonance. Always remember, if, for for instance, I, I buy something. Okay. I got these Samsung AirPods, right? And after I buy them, I feel like, wow, 10K for these earphones is really expensive. What did I do? This is called cognitive dissonance. When your action and thinking doesn't match each other, right? So what do we do to avoid it? Either I tell myself, 10K is totally fine. You know, it's fine. You know, I changed my attitude towards the thing. That's fine right? Or I go back and return it. That's like change of behavior. So similarly to manage your stress, either think about your expectations, maybe you're expecting too much, or an attitude change needs to happen to look at the bigger picture. And asking your question, how do you adapt to things? Would this thing really matter down the road? I had a mentor that I took training for in terms of coaching, and he always used to say this, If it doesn't matter in the next five years, think of it in the five years. Does it matter? If if the answer is no, it doesn't matter. Don't waste five minutes on it because it wouldn't matter in the five year, coming five years. So it's not even worth spending your five minutes on it. And that's why just adapt. Let it go in that sense. And sometimes we are in our work as well or with people, we are perfectionist. We expect everything to be either full or nothing, all or nothing. So that also needs to be uh, worked on. So how, what we consider good enough, for instance. So that needs to be talked about so we can adapt. So maybe your workplace is not the ideal workplace that you have in your mind that you'll be in a forest, in a container. And you know those, those luxury offices, which are very much like you see in Facebook and Google, you're like, I deserve to be there, but I'm not. But for now you can adapt. Uh, you will live in the reality, which is now while we are hoping for the better things. And finally, and this is really essential, acceptance. Interestingly, I was reading the survey, and this is about US. In 2017, the people, uh, they, or they were really thinking about is the change of the government. Similarly, people stress about politics. Right now in Turkey, elections are coming and people are stressed, or in India, whenever the elections come. But the reality is we have very little power or no power over uh, when it, who is going to be the next president or the prime minister. So the idea, ultimately, what really helps us to uh, manage our stress and to be successful in life is acceptance. So ask yourself, uh, how much are we accepting of the things and what do we do? you know, um, to gain acceptance in the life. We do another activity for that, okay? So you have um, in front of you, your paper and a pen. Let's draw two concentric circles. One circle here. If you can see the circle here, this is one circle. It's a smaller circle. You can make it much bigger, by the way, if you have a bigger notebook, because mine is smaller. 
and then you make a bigger circle outside of it so you have two concentric circles you have a small circle and you have a bigger circle so you have two circles right now in the two circles in the inner circle the smaller circle we'll write and make a list of things that we can control like I'll show you my inner and outer circle. It's called the circles of life activity. So my inner circle, what I can control is dress. I knew that I have uh, this workshop to deliver. So I had a shirt on. I was like, I love wearing a vest. And that's a therapist instinctual thing. So let me just put it on. I can control it. But weather outside, when I look outside today is really sunny. And I'm actually loving it. Uh, spring in Istanbul is really beautiful. You see the tulips and everything growing. and It's, it's amazing. And but the weather yesterday it was so cold and rainy and i wanted it to be hot it was not but i can't control it i have no control over how the weather is going to be so it's in the outer circle so what i want you is also to write things in the inner circle that you can control and in the outer circle things you cannot control and what do you refer here to remember the list you made things that are stressing you out the refer to that list and add to that as well. How many things in that list you think you cannot control? It could be the, the behavior of your manager. You can't control it. It's in the outer circle. And in the inner circle, it could be activities that you do. So refer to the list because I said everything is connected. So the activity in which you wrote things which are stressing you out, out of those things, Tell me actually if your boss's behavior is stressing you, but then you cannot control it. That goes in the outer circle. But if something is stressing you, which you can control, put it in the inner circle. And it could be other things as well that you could put in the inner and outer circle. So I'm going to give you three minutes. Timer is there. So in the three minutes, please fill this inner and outer circle. Inner, things you can control. Outer things you cannot control. So keep writing things, what you can and cannot do. You can take care of your health. You can go for health checks, for example. You can do self-care. Those are all in the inner uh, circle. Other people's behavior, uh, daily weather, or things which are beyond your control, results of certain things which you don't know exactly about. Other people's behavior, co-workers, your boss, other, that's in the outer circle. We still have a minute to go. So add as much as you like. And even when we finish this activity, it's an interesting activity. You can keep on doing and you can keep on adding to um, these couple of circles. We call them circles of life or circles of control. All right. I hope you are done and you have the list. And there are things that you wrote about that stress you because we have the list of stressful things that we did in the beginning. And now we try to put them here. So the idea of this whole activity, and this is one of the core activities that we do in cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, what ends up happening is sometimes we feel stressed because we are trying to control things that we should not be controlling, that we should not be using the resources of our mind upon like other people's behavior. Somebody said something, why did they say it? Why did they do this? Uh, why is my boss the way uh, he is or she is? These are things that you cannot control. A lot of the stress, you can let it go through this activity and you can add on to the things is only focus on things which are in the inner circle. Never try to spend time in things which are in the outer circle. A lot of the times what ends up happening is we feel stressed because a lot of our focus of life is in the outer circle rather than the things that we can control. We have to accept that we can only change things which are within our control, our attitude, our behavior, our dressing, uh, our performance to some extent, right? But in the outer circle, we have absolutely no control over it. So just let it go. So this is one of the core techniques, not just for stress management, but also for life management. Because sometimes what ends up happening in life is that we are trying to control things that, you know, that we have no control over. And a lot of things in life that we have no control over are just built or based on trust. So for instance, when you fly in a plane, you never go to the cockpit and ask the pilot, like how much flying experience do you actually have? You just trust him or her with your life. And that's how most of the things work in our life. 
and it's not just uh, transport, many other things work like that because these are things we have no control over. So focus on things you can actually control. So these four A's about avoiding and adapting and uh, checking out in terms of uh, accepting and avoiding, altering, uh, adapting, and then uh, accepting. So ultimately the key is acceptance of things we can control and we cannot control, really essential. Now, which brings us uh, to the idea that if we don't manage your stress using these four A's, like you know, avoiding or adapting or altering or accepting, what happens if we don't have this acceptance? What will end up happening logically is what we call as a burnout syndrome. So burnout syndrome is not a disorder, it's a syndrome, which means in the list of mental health disorders, it's not there, but it is a condition. And condition means it's a serious condition in which a person feels very stressed. So when this stress adds up, I'll just quickly go over this. What adds up happening or what is really burnout when we say? Burnout is our reaction to prolonged stress. Remember, too much stress for a too much amount of time leads to burnout. And burnout in jobs have three main characteristics or dimensions. Firstly is exhaustion. You always feel tired. You're like, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. That's the first thing. Cynicism. You don't identify much with the job. I mean, you're, you're, you're just not interested. You know, you don't identify with it. This is not for me. And the third thing is, even though you're a professional, you're a professional programmer, you're a pro professional marketeer, you don't feel you're at the best of your professional ability. You feel your ability is diminished. So always feeling tired, identifying less and less with your job, and you feel like your professional ability has gone way down. So those are the three characteristics of burnout. All the three have to be present in order to say that somebody's going through burnout, okay? So it's not only about work, it's mainly about work, but there are other factors which can lead to burnout as well. So for example, uh, family can be a contributor, uh, the environment that you live in, all of those can be contributors as well. So uh, those things can end up um, happening. Now, burnout symptoms, we talked more about uh, these in the stress um, symptoms. And one of the reasons, one of the core uh, reasons I'll tell you in burnout is what we saw in the reports as well, the one I quoted from McKinsey, uh, is when uh, workforce or employees feel that they have been treated unfairly or they deserve more. Um, I deserve this promotion. Why did somebody else get it? Or I deserve this uh, or I have been treated unfairly. And when you feel ultimately burnout keeps happening over a period of time, when you feel you're not well compensated for your time, and your efforts. So you have to, and companies, I always advise this at managerial level, is we have to recognize the strengths of the people and feel that they feel that they're properly incentivized. And that later on leads to better health and that leads to better you know, workplace outcomes. So now, apart from we discussed the four ways or the four A's to uh, overcome stress, remember we talked about fight or flight response. Uh, we talked about how when we are running from something, when we are in a panic mode, more of the blood flows to bigger muscles like legs, which means lesser blood for the brain. And that's why when we are in a state of panic, we are not able to make clear decisions. But then the logical question or the next logical question to ask would be, which I did not ask there, I'm asking it now. What do we do to reverse this process? How do I get the blood flow back to my brain in order to feel relaxed, manage my stress, and to make those higher decisions of peak performance? That is the question. And that question I'll answer in a simple way. And I'll teach you how. And this needs us to work together. This is human. And this is a generic human that we always use in therapy, okay? Now, what happens is if we need to get this blood flow back to the brain, there is a fast and a really effective manner to do it. And that method is called deep breathing. Now, when we say deep breathing, it just does not mean breathing deeply. In other words, in clinical terms, we call it diaphragmic breathing. So what is diaphragmic breathing and how is it different from any other breathing? I'll show you using, because you cannot see all of my body. Otherwise, I'll give you my own example. That's how we teach it to our clients. This is the chest part. This is the stomach part. Chest, stomach, chest, stomach. 
So what happens is normal breathing is your chest, your lungs get inflated, okay? And you breathe. That's how it is. In diaphragmic breathing, under the lungs, you know, the lungs and the other parts of the body, they are separated by the sheet. It's called diaphragm. In diaphragmic breathing, the stomach has to come out much more than the chest does. So that is when you call as deep breathing and that's what de-stresses you. And the question would be, how do I know if I'm breathing normally or if it's diaphragmic breathing? The simplest way to do is, and you have to do this by the way with me, otherwise you wouldn't uh, have the outcomes. The simplest way to do is if it's normal or diaphragmic breathing, some of you might be already knowing this, you put a hand on your chest and you put another one on your stomach and it takes a while. I still sometimes get it wrong. And that's why I still practice it sometimes like this. One hand on the chest, one hand on the stomach. Then when you breathe in, you will feel your stomach, your lower hand has to come out. You know, it has to go a bit out much more than your chest. But if your chest is only coming out, that's not deep breathing. So again, one hand on the one hand on chest, one hand on stomach. And we follow the prompt on the screen. When it's getting smaller, we breathe in until it's smallest. Bigger is breathe out. And you breathe out really slow. Try it with me for a minute. Let's do deep breathing for one minute only. Following the prompt on the screen, breathe in and breathe out slowly. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Now I don't need my hands there. I can feel it. Breathe in, breathe out. And that was just one minute of deep breathing. And even a single minute based on so many different studies shows that it can instantly give you the relief. Why? From the stress. And you can do this literally. I'm on my work chair right now. This is the chair that I do all my work on. And while I was practicing it with you, Trust me, I did feel relieved. And the reason for that relief is actually the blood flow starts going back to the brain and you start feeling uh, relieved. And it might sometimes sound counterproductive, all my stress, all my worries and anxiety, and the answer is in deep breathing. Yes, it is. Diaphragmic breathing, deep breathing. So this is something you can do literally when you're on your office chair. You can make it a practice to do it before you start work after you finish your work, it's a compulsory thing for us therapists. Like, you know, when we finish sessions or when we are doing activities or when we have supervision before and after, we always try diaphragmic breathing and always teach it to others as well. And another thing what this deep breathing does is it not only brings blood back to the brain, you also start feeling control in your life. Because when you're anxious or stressed, you feel you cannot control anything. But first, when you control your breathing, you know when to inhale and then to exhale. It brings control back to life and which really leads way bigger to management of stress. Another activity that we do, and we can do this together, we call it grounding activity that we use for managing stress and which can instantly relieve you of your stress. So everybody, whoever is here, we are like 117 people. Let's do it together, okay? I want you to, I mean, I wouldn't be able to hear you, but I want you to label things for me. Tell me five things that you can see around you. Five things. Let me tell you, my human, I can see my human, I can see my big monitor, my laptop, uh, my phone charger, and my studio light. 
So those are five things I can see. Name five things that you're seeing uh, around yourself. You know, label them, see it for yourself. Five things that you can see. Four things that you can touch. Literally around you, whatever four things that you have closest to you, touch them. My chair, I'm touching it. My notebook, uh, the human here, I touched. And my wallet here, four things you can touch. Three things you can hear. Focus on three sounds that you can hear. Three sounds, I can hear myself. I can hear somebody outside speaking. And I can hear the clock, which is on the other side of the room, the seconds. Three sounds that you can hear. So ask yourself the three sounds you can hear. Two things you can smell. Two things that you can smell. Mints. I can smell those. And I put perfume on, I can smell it. Two things that you can smell. And one thing that you can taste. It's Ramadan, so I cannot taste. But uh, one thing that you can taste is it can be the aftertaste of something that you have already eaten. But other thing that I always have, like you saw, these are extra mints. Like these are chewing gums, but they are really strong chewing gums, mint chewing gums. Have them with you. Why? Because when you taste something like this, it instantly makes you feel grounded. So what is the this five, four, three, two, one grounding technique. It's a calming exercise for stress. Why? Because it activates all your five senses. Think about it. Five things you see, four things you touch, three things you hear, two things you smell, and one thing you can taste. And generally, if you have nothing around or no aftertaste, keep mints with you. So what ends up happening is, if you just did this activity, but it was more controlled environment, do it on your own, five, four, three, two, one. You start feeling no, you're present here. And because of your sensual activation, it leads to uh, calming you down. So whenever you do deep breathing, make sure whenever you're doing deep breathing, you do the grounding technique at the same time. Like, you know, what are uh, the five, four, three, two, one things that we have to do to uh, treat my um, myself from uh, stress. Okay. So coming to the final part of the presentation, which I'll go through very briefly, is the idea of how do we move from burnout to bliss? if we are feeling stressed and how do we ultimately feel um, happy? First key is knowing that life is not linear. It's like a heartbeat. There are ups and downs. If there is a flat line, it means the person is dead, which means everybody has a unique story. Life is very unique in itself. So don't compare yourself with others. If we have to understand, uh, all our journeys are unique. So uh, in order to uh, celebrate that spirit very well, uh, let's do an activity. And in this case, we are uh, going to draw. You know, I was never very proud of my drawing, but then sometimes the artist within me, it starts coming up. Now, I'll ask you to draw something. And uh, I'll give you a few minutes to draw it. So what do I want you to draw? Let me give it a thought. I know what I want you to draw, but uh, yeah. I want you to draw uh, without looking, without any cheating, without Googling, without using your phone, without using your wallet. I want you to draw a hundred rupee note, Indian note, hundred rupees, you know, hundred rupee note. I want all of you to draw a note, which is a hundred rupee note. By the way, two boxes. I want two rectangles, one from the front side, one from the back side. Okay, so without looking, without cheating, you have uh, three minutes to whatever you can remember of a hundred rupee note. In three minutes, draw it and bring out your artistic skills, the Picasso in you. So draw. You got good three minutes. Test your skills.
couple of minutes more. Remember, what can you remember? What are the elements there? How is the design? Think and think. Think and put it in the ink and start drawing. Still have a good one minute. Any details that you can remember, you can draw. Still have a little while. Maybe I'll give you only 15 more seconds at 30 seconds. I'm going to take 30 seconds away from you. All right, keeping in view the other agenda that we have. So let's put it until here. Great. I hope you guys have an idea or you have an image at least. Now, if you look at the real 100 rupee note, I mean, I don't have it here on the slide or in my pocket. I had it somewhere else. You will see that it's a huge way behind it's a whole, whole way it's it's a whole different level and when you see a hundred rupee note if somebody has it or later on even you can come in and show it up uh the idea is that even when i did it for the first time uh i didn't get it even one percent correct you know there are big elements missing ashoka pillar major languages governor's signature i promised to pay the bearer the sum of the hundred rupees uh mahatma gandhi's picture on one side on the emblem on the other and then the whatever details there are, the intrinsic details, the year in which the uh, bill was issued. So these are the bigger details and forget about the smaller details. And it is something that we commonly use, you know, and we use it so commonly and we use it so many times sometimes. I mean, I know that we have shifted to digital wallets, but uh, all of us, I mean, we're of an age that we have used uh, currency, which is, which is the paper currency. But despite of that, um, we are not able to get it correct. And why does that happen? It happens because we call it automatic processing in uh, psychological terms. It means something is so common in your life that we stop paying attention. When was the last time you left home, you locked the door and you were like, did I lock it or not? Maybe I did not. Or did I actually close the um, fridge or did I close the stove? I can't remember. And you know why? Can't you remember if you forgot the keys, if uh, you locked the door? It is because you lock the door every single day. After you do it every single day, your brain goes on autopilot mode because the brain wants to preserve energy. So it no longer spends energy using when, whenever you're locking the door because it's a habit now. So when brain uses no resources, so you have no memory of it. Lock it or not? Like, you know, did I actually lock it? This is what we call as automatic processing. And similarly, uh, our life has become automatic processing. Why? Because we are generally on an autopilot mode where we take a lot of things for granted. You know, we see things a lot, like we see a hundred rupee note very much, or we have seen it a lot, but still we don't remember the details. Similarly, there are many finer things in life. Uh, we have beautiful things in life that we don't take benefit of. It can be your parents. It can be your family. It can be good friends. It can be a nice job. It can be being thankful for being alive. I think gratitude and counting our blessings rather than complaining, because I see this attitude, we're always complaining and that's not, a, that's not a good way to go. And studies show that people who practice gratitude, which means not taking things for granted, it's not only like doing prathna or you know, before God you pray and others, but it's also the idea that uh, you are thankful and we manifest it in our life. We don't take things for granted. We are thankful for them. And we tell, for example, people that we love, that we love them. It's very essential to do that. So gratitude is one of the things, if you want to be stress-free or manage your stress, practice gratitude. And then self-awareness. It means be aware of who you are, what your qualities are. Very essential. And then freeing yourself. I mean, freeing yourself from social expectations, from what car does my neighbor have? I need a better one. 
or what house is my coworker living in? I need a, something better than that. So this comparison, this social comparison and this hierarchy, it can lead to unnecessary stress. So freedom is a mental construct. Don't think freedom exists in reality. It exists in the mind. You are free the day you tell yourself that I'm free of this. It's really important to free yourself from comparison with others in order to manage your stress. Connect with others. Uh, research studies show that when you are in touch with your family, with your friends, uh, it leads to huge gains in terms of mental health. It's really essential to have good social connections, including your family. And acknowledging your feelings, which means accepting yourself, like we talked about acceptance a lot and the circles of control. So even if you feel something feels negative, like stress, it doesn't mean you have to run away with it, but rather we have to deal with it. So ultimately, um, stress is not always a bad thing like we talked about. It can be a motivator. And remember, talking about stress is actually a good thing. It doesn't mean we have to avoid it. And remember, um, don't get overwhelmed because you have too many things to do. Rather than that, we choose our priorities properly. All right? And so to sum it up, if we have to just properly sum it up, stress is our body's natural reaction in which we have to adjust. It's not always harmful in short term. It's actually good. It's not bad. And we cannot avoid stress altogether. But we can actually do is we can manage it properly. And based on the scientific details that we have and evidence that we have, deep breathing, grounding techniques that we talked about, it re leads to releasing of uh, you know hormones that relieve stress. Physical activity, like I talked about, remember? Because of uh, sitting in the chairs or doing corporate jobs, many of us don't get the moment. Remember, body needs one hour of moment every single day. It means walking. And by the way, this is different than exercising and going to the gym. Generally take out time to take walks. Walks are very healthy. They release serotonin. They relieve us of stress. And ultimately taking time off. If you feel you're stressed because you haven't taken a holiday or a leave in a while, trust me, do it. You'll be doing yourself a great favor if you're doing that. And ultimately... If uh, professional help is needed and you want to speak to a therapist, we care so much about our hearts. We should care something about our mind as well. So there is absolutely no problem if you want to seek uh, therapy or professional help about issues which may be about stress related or which might also not be stress related. So in the end, uh, once again, after we went through the workshop, I want you to rate yourself on your stress thermometer again, because we did some activities. Like we learned some coping mechanisms with stress. We learned what it is. And we also learned some problem solving skills when it comes to um, stress. So we did some things practically like, you know, deep breathing and grounding. But we also learned how to cope up in terms of the four A's. So now after you have the tools, you literally have a toolbox, all of it in terms of your thinking with the four A's and in terms of practically doing deep breathing and grounding exercises and uh, being grateful, et cetera. So all of these things are actually a toolkit for stress management. And now you have this, and now you should be feeling empowered that I have something that I know actually works based on evidence to relieve me of my stress. So now again, with the stress thermometer, where do you rate yourself after going through the program? So ask yourself, what was my number before? Because you took a reading and how do you rate yourself now? Okay, so uh, do that. So before we go on to the question and answers, I would really love to thank out all of the, um, you know, people who organize this program and who are, uh, uh, you know, here as participants. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that you took out time to uh, listen to the presentation for taking out the time. And I'm especially thankful to Ethica Insurance Broking Private Limited uh, for organizing and keeping organizing uh, these programs regularly in a sustainable manner. So, I mean, uh, I go to my LinkedIn profile and I see Ethica is always trying to do different things, dance movements. We're talking about feedback. We're talking about stress management. So it has almost become like this sustainable platform, which really cares in India about the well-being of other people. So I think I'm really thankful for that because I'm an advocate of mental health and mental health is a huge thing. There are so many things. And I think Ethica is in the right direction, understanding and trying to tap into the human potential by talking issues that affect our mental health. So thank you very much for that. And those of you who want to stay in touch uh, my uh, Twitter, Instagram, I'm very active on Instagram, Facebook, wherever. 
you are so the handle is universal youtube is the same thing it's at yakin skander which is which happens to be my name so thanks to all of you stay in touch i would love to hear from you stay in touch with you and uh, this is my uh, handle for my social media and uh, i do use social media and i try to personally reach out to as many people as i can i mean in terms of replying back and stuff so thank you so much to everybody and now the time for uh, question and answers i believe we have time and i would love to you know hear from you in terms of comments questions and what do you think thank you so much thank you so much again for the wonderful inputs that you have given so before we move to q and a section i would like to take this opportunity to launch a feedback poll to understand uh, how everyone liked the session so i request all the audience to answer the poll that you see on your screens and in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can raise your hands so that I can move you to panel and you can ask your questions to Yakin directly. And also you can put your questions in the chat box so that I can read it out for you and your questions will be answered now. So we have a couple of questions in the chat box and also in the Q&A section. So Yakin, uh, one question is, can you suggest something for anger management? right uh anger management uh somebody asked the question about that so can i answer now yes right 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 i think this is uh, a very common uh, thing that we see in therapy and uh, i even teach a workshop on uh, you know uh, anger management interestingly uh when it comes to emotions and because i look at it from a perspective of a clinician anger is actually a healthy emotion if we talk about it you know and the idea is this, every emotion has a need, you know, and this is generally, I'm telling this for everybody because we are human beings. When we do studies in therapy, uh, and I do what we call as emotion-focused therapy as well, uh, emotions have needs. For example, love. Love is a huge emotion. So the need of the emotion of love is to be close to what we love. It can be a thing, a hobby, a person. We want to be close. Similarly, uh, we have fear. Fear is a strong emotion as well. What is the need of the emotion of fear? It's safety. So whenever we're afraid, we want to be safe. Now, what is the need of anger when we talk about as emotion of anger? It is justice. We are angry when we think injustice is being done to us. And we want to keep that barrier so that no more injustice is done to us. So we start feeling angry. So anger in this case is a healthy emotion. And to express it is actually healthy because if anger is unexpressed it becomes resentment and it goes inward becomes maladaptive so that's one way of first thinking about anger what it is cognitively first it's an emotion it's a healthy emotion but the idea of uh, when we talk about anger management and we are talking about being angry so if it is happening on the people that have not done anything wrong with you or that have not done anything and you're more more irritable so i think that's when uh, we talk about things like analyze your anger. And what do we do first? We try to make a list of triggers. Always remember, make a list of your triggers, what actually makes you angry. You know, huh? this person's behavior makes me angry or this makes me angry or that makes me angry. So then what we do in therapy is we talk about if this makes you angry about someone, is it their fault or it has something to do with you? Okay, so list of triggers, or sometimes if something triggers me, avoid those triggers. That's the first part. Quickly, I'll tell you. And another thing what you can do is writing those triggers, like I said, you can journal about it. You have to train yourself because anger is almost instinctual. You're angry, you want to react. You know, you want to go into a mode where you react. So what we try to do is in our anger management workshop, and we have these situations where, you know, somebody provokes somebody, and then we try to intervene. How? don't just react respond because anger puts you in a reactive mode it's like an instinct you quickly want to react back it's like a reflex right and you burst out and then you regretted what you're doing so from that reaction we want to go to the respond mode and how do we do that we have to train ourselves when you get angry don't do anything about it maybe drink a glass of water or uh, whatever you're doing um you know do something different than that but do not, if you're angry with the person, if you're angry with um, something else, do not react, just respond and take a time in between. 
you're ang you're angry, we put a buffer in between. Generally, it's like this: anger, reaction, anger, reaction. So we want to put a buffer in between in which you have a time to think, to pause, to reflect, and then to act. So this is what I can quickly tell you about uh, anger management. But then it's a much more detailed topic. It takes time to train ourselves. But at the top of my head, these are a couple of techniques that you can try. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Akin. Uh, we have an interesting question. Mm -hmm. In the 4 days part on mm -hmm. avoidance, mm -hmm. I have said to my manager, I have already loaded paper. Mm -hmm. He again mm -hmm. ordering to extend and work, which makes me more difficult right can we right. avoid these extension situations right uh look there are people or who are at who are higher in corporate hierarchy than you now the first thing that you can do is while being assertive was what you said the idea is if you talk to your boss and uh, you tell your boss that you already have a lot of things on your plate how am i gonna how are you gonna manage it yes there might be some people who are unrealistic or like you have to do it anyways if you want to keep the job. There are people who will threaten you. I, I mean, even though that's not the best way to do, it does happen. And that is unfortunate. But what I'm trying to say here is that in most of the situations, it should work. With most of the people, it does work. Because if your boss is somebody who is a reasonable person, who knows how to negotiate properly, and who knows that personnel or employee well-being is essential for company success, it wouldn't happen. Like it shouldn't happen. And that would, in that case, that would mean it would come in the outer circle that we talked about. It's something that you cannot control. But at the same time, if it's a problem, if you cannot take it to the boss and he doesn't, is there somebody else that you can talk about this? Because you cannot keep suffering from this, that if you have a lot of work already on your plate and the person is like, you have to do much more than he or she tells you, no, you have to do this one as well. And you really have no time to adjust it. So how do you redress it? Because it depends on the organizational structure and stuff. Is there somebody else that you can talk to it about it? Is there HR that you can refer to? Or if this person is like, you know, being inconsiderate, you know? So that's why uh, the idea is even the person who are higher in hierarchy than you, you work together. You work, you know, with them not necessarily for them. You all work for the same company, right? You know what I mean? So these hierarchies lately have changed, especially, and they should, especially in the newer uh, workplace culture. So idea is either you tell the boss and they understand, and if they don't, um, and if they keep pressurizing you and it's making you feel stressed, are there relevant people higher ups or in the HR or anywhere else? Or do other people have the same complaints with this person? If yes, gain that support and see what you can change. So remember, only focus on things that you can actually change, not the ones that you cannot change. I hope that answers you. Great. So Neha Kumari Patel is telling right. that, thank, thanks Yakin for your time. And You're love welcome. the point where you mentioned that stress acts as motivation factor. Yeah. Till it's in limited scope. However, mm -hmm. work from home, mm -hmm. loses human contact, human yes. conversation, chit chat at water coolers, etc. with colleagues. Uh, right. So how can it be handled with work from home? Right. So she is not against work from home, but it does mm -hmm. with its own baggages. Right. So how do Correct. we lead? Correct. Uh, a couple of things. I think when uh, uh, the whole uh, pandemic thing started and things started getting online, uh, it, it was it was a, like a more of a paradigm shift and a lot of things, because I know this from a mental health scenario, people started feeling more anxiety initially before they adjusted to the new systems and all. Uh, and, and this is right, by the way, human touch, seeing people like, you know, getting a coffee together or going to the pantry, doing all these kinds of things. It is really essential, but the online world has taken that away. I can understand working from home. But the question that then would be, <clears throat> even though it's not the colleagues directly, but do you have connection with other people? So two things here. I remember I was doing this program for a company and we set up some online activities for the whole team. So for example, there are smaller teams. They had this, it was a consultancy and they had team leaders, and then a team leader has like five or six members in the team. They had a similar issue. What about the cohesion? We were so close to each other before the pandemic. So we came up with certain rituals. Rituals are really essential. Companies have rituals, right? It can be the meetings, it can be the other things or a retreat every year, whatever the rituals are. So the rituals that we set was uh, specific times for meeting each other, 
informal talking, some online quizzes, activities, uh, movie night together. So if you can do something like this, and it doesn't have to be approved by the company, it can be with the people that you work with. So if you can have a group and do group activities together, which can be online, you know, there can be trivias, games and other things and watching Netflix or anything together can be as simple as that. Uh, now, uh, you can also meet them somewhere else uh, because of the pandemic has finished, but even though you're working remotely, but other than that, in general, you need to have a physical face-to-face -face support system. If it's not the people that are in your office, it can be your family, it can be your partner, it can be a friend circle that you have wherever you live. It's extremely essential to have face-to-face -face connections, by the way, and you are totally right with that. So if you're working from home, and you are doing some online activities with your friends and that's already happening. If it's not happening, do those as well. Set up certain things that you can to enjoy uh, with the people that you work with, but at the same time, have a face-to-face -face support system with others because it's really essential uh, to have that in order to improve our well-being. Hope that answers you. I'm second. And one last question. Mm -hmm. How to balance stress at work and stress at home? Mm -hmm. stress impacts our quality of lives or work at workplace and at home right i think it's a very essential question uh when we talked about this idea of um stress management and we talked about burnout and i think uh, one of the reasons that people burn out is not only because of the work it's also because work is already stressful and then they go home it's another battle right um that's the problem where it starts. Like some people are like some people are more resilient in the sense than others. Why? Because they have protective factors, what we call. Uh, they have a good partner or they have a good family. They, they go there and even the workplace stress is, um, you know, relieved. So the idea is we have to also ask ourselves, what is it that is making me stressed about the family? And again, the concept, um, you know, this idea that the inner and the outer circle thing about the family, are there things that uh, you can actually change? So do them. And now here's the part. In Western cultures, it's much easier. You can just move out and do whatever you like. It's a very individualized lifestyle. I can understand in our culture, it's more collectivistic. So we cannot cut off toxic people all the time, I understand. And that's why what we can do is we can create boundaries you know, like assertiveness skills. And that's what we teach in therapy for many, many sessions that we have with individual uh, people. It's about recognizing the sources of your worry or your anxiety or your stress, write them down. What is in the work that is making you stressed and what can you do about it in the inner circle? Similarly, what is making you stressed about your family? You know, what is it? And uh, if it's within the family, do you have to be there? Can you take care of them while living somewhere else? And what is it about the family that is uh, stressing you? And have you communicated it with the family members, husband, wife, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, extended family, that uh, how you're feeling stressed because of these actions? So I think there are small steps. Uh, it's not something that you can radically do. But at the same time, remember, one of the things which is Negative, what, what I see negatively in our culture of the subcontinent or India when we talk about in particular is our concept of sacrifice can mean we have to do things for others, but it can mean at our own cost. We have to literally like kill ourselves because it can benefit our family and others and things like that. I love sacrifice. I love this about our culture, but to the extent that you even forget your own self, that is where it becomes problematic. And that's what causes stress as well. What does that mean? It means if you feel uh, like, you know, cannot avoid, cannot alter, you know, adapting is a problem, accepting has issues. How much time have you taken out for yourself? Because the way beautiful things, sacrifice, you want to give all the beautiful things to your family. You want to be there for them. You want to sacrifice for them. I think you deserve those beautiful things of life as well. So ask yourself, have you created this inner space for yourself? And you know how I do it. I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, you know, that might be something uh, food for thought or what I do practically. I always tell myself, my day is 22 hours. I have never told myself from a few years that a day has 24 hours. So for me, and I teach this as an activity when we do extended corporate uh, workshops, I say my day is 22 plus two hours. It's 24 hours, which means this, sleep, work, therapy sessions, research, teaching, Everything that I do, 
I do it within 24 hours, I t- uh, 22 hours. I tell myself I have 22 hours. The other two hours, they're just for me. No matter how busy I am, they're for writing a journal. Sometimes they're for just doing nothing. Sometimes they are just to watch something, um, anything. So ask yourself as well. Have you created, and this is generally for everybody. Have you created that personal space for yourself? For, so for my personal space is 22 plus two. Anything, no matter how urgent, how slow, whatever it is, it is has to be done in 22 hours. Other two hours, they're mine. And that is time for myself because I want to show respect, love to myself as well. So similarly, if you feel you're stressed in work and you're stressed at home, so I think you're caught in between and I can understand that dilemma. So asking yourself, what is it that you're doing for yourself on daily basis? And this is a question for everybody that you can take a note on your notebook. What is it that I do on daily basis every single day, even if it's five or 10 minutes, every single day I do it consistently, but it's just for me. It's not for my work, my boss, my colleague, my friend, my family. It is for me because it makes me feel who I am. It makes me more connected to myself. So ask yourself this question. So one of the ways to relieve that stress from home or for work, even though it can be difficult, is sometimes between these two things, you are ignoring and forgetting yourself and your present because focus is more about what you have to do for others rather than what you need, you know, in terms of your emotion. So focusing that what you have to do or what you must do, focusing the attention, taking it off from there to what you might need. And it might be a rest. It might be somebody supporting you, listening to you. It might be you taking out time for a vacation and just 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 spending time with yourself. It can be anything. So focus on what you need you know, rather than what you have to do. And I hope that really helps you. Okay. Yeah. One last question, Yakin. Yes. So outer circles concept is fantastic and mm-hmm. it, uh, it will minimize the stress. Mm-hmm. But if everything I cannot change move to outer circle, mm-hmm. but bothers me a lot. Right. Is the only solution. Right. What if consequences are irreversible. Right. Um, if everything you cannot change, it moves to outer circle. Now, here's the thing. It might bother you depending on what are the things in the outer circle. Now, a lot of the things is which are, you are, which are stressing you and actually you move them to the outer circle. Then you're like, all of them is, all of them are beyond my control. I cannot control anything. And that can bother a person. I can understand that because before we had this perceived idea of we are controlling these things and we are calling the shots. And certainly when you do this activity, because I have seen this pattern happening, a lot of things in the life, they move to the outer circle. And then you're like, what am I left with? Am I so powerless? Do I have no control? And idea is this, consequences can be irreversible, but the idea is rather than saying that how many things are in the outer circle, how many things are in the inner circle? You know, have you thought about that? You can control your actions, for example, your success, your performance, and uh, your behavior, uh, things, your outlook on life, um, many things that are under our control. So yes, one focuses on the things that we cannot control, we put them back, but also increasing the experiences. Uh, you know, so increasing the experiences that you can actually control because the idea of the activity is it makes us think. Um, The idea is like this. When things we start moving from inner to the outer circle, we start feeling I have nothing left and I cannot control things. And that is not true. It only happens. Why? It happens because uh, of the reason that we have never done this before and we have not counted the things we actually have Uh, control over. And trust me, we have control over a lot of things, our success trajectory, over, uh, you know, what bothers you and what doesn't, over like, you know, what other people do to you and you just let it go. And uh, what simple things like what you veer to who you want to become in life. All these are possibilities, hundreds of these possibilities where you want to spend your time. Like we talked about the concept of sacrifice and making time and space for yourself. You can certainly control it. You can certainly control. So when you see the world around you, the way it is very modern, very tech savvy, remember it is made by people who are no different than you and me, right? But this sense of agency and feeling that uh, being in control. So 
if there are most of the things which move to the outer circle, it's actually a good news. Those are not the things that you should be bothered about. Rather than that, now if your inner circle is blank, imagine it's like a blank canvas. Now literally you can draw on it. You can prioritize things. You can do things as you want them to. So I think it's another chance that sometimes life is providing us that can take us to, you know, to things that we thought before were impossible. And I hope that answers you. Great. Thank you so much again for that wonderful answer. And once again, I thank you for taking time and agreeing, uh, agreeing to do session for us. And I thank all the audience for attending the session. And with this, we came to an end of the webinar. Thank you. Thank and you so much. It was it was a pleasure. It was beautiful. And thanks to every single beautiful uh, participant, uh, participants, all of you and Venkat and Shiva and everybody else. Thank yourselves. And uh, I thank you as well for being a part of this uh, program. And I hope this was uh, beneficial. And later on, you will share the feedback with me, I hope as well. Okay. And uh, it would be beautiful to go over, especially some of the answers and how uh, uh, we can improve more uh, in the future. And that's the idea, right? Uh, yeah. And somebody asked this question really quick. Which mint do you, did you recommend? I don't know if you have it in India. It's called Vivident, you know? So yeah, in India, you have Mentos. So yeah, I love Mentos. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, whole idea. So thank you so much. Uh, you've been a beautiful audience and uh, stay in touch. You have my uh, social media handle and sometimes I share content and we can do more programs in the future. So thank you so much. It was a wonderful delight having you all. So take care, everybody. And I hope to see you soon again. Thanks, Akin. And all the audience, next week we are coming with a session on the ABCs of nutritional label reading, understanding what's really in your food. So see you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.